Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We'll just give it a bit of uh, another minute or so uh, just to let everyone kind of trickle in and we'll get started here for the afternoon session. OK, I think we can get started here. Um, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time in this platform, welcome. Uh, and for those who have joined us in a previous uh, session, thank you for again for taking the time of joining us on our monthly dedicated local Q&A session. Once again, you know, this is an open uh, platform for infrastructure owners to get monthly updates on the dedicated local care program, share your feedbacks, experience, concerns, lesson learns throughout the program rollout. Just a few housekeeping, this session will be recorded and will be shared on our web, uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, please refrain your, uh, your feedback, questions, and concerns till the end of our presentation, to which we'll open up the floor at that point. So you have two options there. You can actually use the, the uh, raise hand function if you would like to speak, uh, or use the Q&A chat function to input your question, and one of our team members will share your questions to the group. Um, and if we're unable to get through any of your questions, we'll reach out to you directly after this session. Now, in today's session, I'll be providing you a quick monthly update on Dedicated Locator. Then we'll dive in a little bit on the Dedicated Locator Service Provider viewpoint with our guest speaker led uh, group to talk about their experiences in, uh, in Dedicated Locator as a contractor and transitioning to a service uh, to servicing as a Dedicated Locator Service Provider on their own project. OK, so with this one, uh, so with April result, we saw a positive increase of DL locate requests submitted in our system with several projects activated and on their way. We're seeing similar incline trajectory um, patterns that we saw last year uh, and with more pending projects coming close to full approval with the DL submission process, we can anticipate this, uh, you know, projects being active in the coming months as well. We're also seeing more designated broadband projects notice submission as we close out May and June around the corner. We may see a shift in the industry where the interest rate uh, update is coming up this June, so more projects are resuming. Uh, more of these broadband uh, designated broadband projects are coming through and fully uh, either resuming their, their, their projects that they had previously or uh, putting new submission to new areas and, and such. So we're, we're hoping to see uh, you know, a positive traction as we're seeing this as of right now with April. Um, and from there, you know, obviously with the peak season, uh, we would see a lot of these projects take advantage during that time with the dedicated low care program. <clears throat> now, this is the first time we're sharing this slide. Uh, this slide illustrates to which sector we are seeing the DL low care requests and are coming from. As you can see at the bottom part here, uh, certainly the broadband projects are with, you know, the broadband projects with fiber to home projects are to push across Ontario. So we're seeing the the usage throughout the, you know, the uh, um, program since we had it activated on was the broadband projects taking the leads of, of the uh, in, uh, itself. So we are seeing a prob uh, predominant uh, in, in the rural areas, whereas you know the transit, municipal, and other type of projects are scattered through the boroughs and urban areas. So there's just a great, you know, see um, good visuals to where we're seeing most of the projects happening and where most of the DL requests are are, are submitted through uh, in the month of April and also year to date. Um, so you know what we're seeing the fiber to homes is the more rural areas are getting affected and we're seeing more of these transition coming across um you know in, in the coming months we are seeing several transit projects coming through dedicated locate projects as well too so we're seeing those numbers a little bit shift as well too and also several municipalities are taking interest of the deal um, model as well too so we're, we're seeing some shift here and there uh, but at the moment right now predominantly the broadband projects are are coming across on the rural area now, continuing from the previous slide here, just to show you a bit of a visual to our top 10 active regions for the dedicated locator usage. Uh, we are seeing here, you know, for the past month still, uh, the Middlesex, York, Haldeman are, are the top four front runners uh, for DL projects. Uh, we have seen um, 
project owners such as Bell Rogers taking uh, use uh, of those areas, York region where we have Telmax as well too. So once again, predominantly by broadband projects coming across, continuing their 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 fiber to home projects all across. And you know, obviously uh, towards the end of this top ten, we're seeing a little bit more of the rural areas being affected. <clears throat> Now, I want to share this data with this group. Year to date, we have received a total of 22 DL project notice submission. 18 of those projects are on track and are still within or coming close to the 90 day timeframe from the day that we received the project notice. Four projects have surpassed the timeframe, but are still progressive, uh, progressing towards to obtain the final approvals from infrastructure owners. What we have seen in some improvements in response time, we, we've seen some improvements in, in the response time and processing time from infrastructure owners within project submission process. We wanna help and continue this trend as we see more project owners interested in utilizing the dedicated locate for their large long-term projects, right? So we are now officially two years in since the Royal Ascent and the introduction of dedicated locator as part of our act, as part of our act and a legislative requirement, right? As an infrastructure owner, ensure you understand your requirements process, determine the timelines required to assess and approve DL project and a dedicated locate service provider. So we're, we're doing, you know, we're seeing a good traction to that. And also, you know, we're just utilize our team here. If you have any questions, if you, if there's requirements on your side of things and, and reach out to us, we can help you have those conversation between a project owner and DLSP to mitigate the, you know, the, the, the issues, concerns and such. Um, but we're seeing, you know, as we see more projects come through, we are seeing better time frames and better improvements in the response time. So this is something, a positive track that we're moving forward. <clears throat> now here are the list of active DL projects. Notable up updates since last month, we have Explore Inc. in the coming weeks uh, that will be providing their DL project notice throughout several lots spread across eastern and western Ontario. Uh, Ontario. So we have that at the bottom here where we have pending submissions. We also have the Here Ontario LRT coming close to full approvals and transition over to the legal dedicated locator program. Although the list, I just wanted to point out this, uh, although the list of the project owner doesn't relatively, uh, you know, it stays the same from the previous month, multiple of these existing project owners have provided new DL project submissions in the past month expanding our existing projects and or mobilizing to new project areas. So we're getting a lot, once again, you know, with, with the interest rate shifting a little bit, more works are coming across. Um, we're, we're seeing more of these existing project owners that are within the broadband um, projects or the designated broadband projects submit full, uh, you know, expanding their areas, submitting other areas that they haven't uh, complied under the, or haven't transitioned over to the dedicated low care model yet. Now, from the previous month's update, we have utility marks, uh, MPL. Uh, now, from the previous month update, we have now utility marks and MPL as active DLSP with their respective projects, receiving full approval here from the affected own, uh, infrastructure owners with their project area. Now, with this list here, once again, you know, there's a, a small shift into, you know, what we're seeing here, but now we have 13 active DLSP two more pending in there and uh, several more that we are in current preliminary conversation with um, and kind of helping uh, assisting them to kind of position themselves to move forward as a DLSP with a project owner. So these are continuous work that we're working with, open conversation. Um, several infrastructure owners have been approached by some of these interested parties. You know, at this point, uh, it, doesn't have to be a formal submission from us at this point. They're just having preliminary conversation inquiring your requirements. So have those open conversations as well too on your side of things that if you do get approached by a, a locate service provider interested into dedicated locator, you can share your, your assessment process timeframes and such like that to just get the preliminary conversation going. Um, we do have our frameworks available on our webpage as well too. So there is a sense of a, uh, a framework or a template for a foundation for them to follow uh, along with our conversation with us. And from their point, and they would reach out to infrastructure owners as well too, to have those preliminary conversation, 
get them set up properly. So once we officially get a formal submission from a project owner, the timeframes are all in line and you're, you will be aware of the project at that point coming through. So you'll be in compliance as well too, as well as the project as well too within the uh, designated timeframes that's provided on, the, uh, on our act for dedicated locator notice. Now here is just a quick update that I provided here, but now I just want to really um, turn the controls over to our guest speaker here today. Uh, we they want to like from there they're sharing their viewpoints, experiences, benefits, and lesson learned navigating through the dedicated low care process, and also their pathway and transitioning to be their own dedicated low care service provider on their own project. As a constructor and a DLSP for their own project, they you know they can truly shed some light and insight of the efficiency, safety, and benefits that comes along with dedicated low care uh, model. So with that, I just want to advise you as well to just uh, you know any questions that we may have um, for you know for us directly or our guest speaker will save that for the end of their slide. But for now, I want to welcome Ifti Rahid, our senior uh, the senior project manager for Ledcor, and also Victor Santos, uh, locate manager of um, LightCore as well too. So I'm going to stop my sharing here and uh, I'll let you guys take it over. Thank you, Marco. You're very fluent in introducing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll take the screen and then I'll, I'll share our slide with you here. Marco, if you can confirm with me, if anyone can see it. Yep, we see it now. Thank you. Perfect. Um, at, before we start, uh, give give a brief introduction of the month of May. Obviously, uh, as you all know, this is uh, National Safety Month. Um, I'm not going into the very uh, all the details of it, but one of uh, one of the leading causes of uh, incidences we found is an awareness of actually knowing what uh, the hazards are out there. So, um, in order to be uh, in order to follow what the safety protocols are, really knowing what the hazards are. So be aware of your surroundings and take precautions. Uh, follow safety uh, instructions. Have plan for emergency. Stay informed. Have safety risk. You know, a lot of ticks are on the in the planet today, so uh, that involves too. Uh, by working together, we can all create a safer environment for everyone. That's my safety share. Before we start, um, just a brief introduction. Uh, introduction, actually, to go. Uh, proceed with everything. Uh, so we are we are led for technical services an overview of what we do uh, today. We are mostly into uh, uh, the wireline space of the build, and that's why we have open a locate division to support. Uh, we are part of LTS technical services, part of led for group of companies, which is 76 years with integrity. We have 100. This is 100% uh, employee owned. Uh, we have 8,140 employees all across. Um, and we actually have our offices all over um, US and uh, North America, which is US and Canada, as you can see, but pretty well spread out. Uh, we've put 90,000 kilometers of fiber in the ground today. We're actually the, the first owners of some of the 360 net network, um, if you all know, that has been sold to Bell today. But, um, you know, just just part of the legacy uh, fiber uh, hall that uh, LTS built in the past. So, without further ado, what we'll do is, uh, since we have given an introduction with LightCore, LightCore Technical Services, I'll move on to uh, dedicated local services provided to, that we have actually uh, taken on uh, since 2023. So, what we have done today, uh, done actually, we have we have some experience. We've had some experience with locate. Uh, Victor was a major part of uh, part of this. We uh, we went in an approach that um, you know we're not we're not completely new because we did have subcontracts out of the major LSP players. So we would locate for the GTELs, the PVS, the Promarks, and all of that. So Victor was the locate uh, was uh, leading that group uh, prior to what he's doing today. Uh, so we created a DLSP approval package, what we were doing with a history of all our knowledge set, and we created a package to understand that this is what we're going to give to uh, the members out there uh, to show that we have experience in what we're doing. Um, well, we, the, one of the main approach that we wanted to do is, hey, we're not, you might be new to us and we might be new to them, 
Um, and that approach uh, is basically a collaborative approach. Say, what do you want? And this is what we have been doing for you under GTEL or under other LSPs before, but we'll be doing that for you directly now. So we are, uh, let me know if you, we understand you clearly, and if not, let's work on it, right? So that's the, that's the collaborative approach. So we took our KMZ, uh, all our built on a project mapping together, put it what based on the project we do and give it to them. Say, this is our this is the road you're going to go. This whole overview of the project, very clear. KMZ and KML works to be the best. We tried PDF, not really, uh, it doesn't do justice to detailing what we're doing. Um, since safety is a top priority, I'll keep in mind, and keep in mind this also says having DLSD does speed up with a lot of advantages, but it is it means way greater responsibility on your shoulders. It just takes the dollar amount that somebody else for a mistake would take on versus now being as one of the uh, excavator as well. Those mistakes are the excavator's mistake too. So at the end of it, uh, for us in specific, we, we learned pretty fast that any mistake, doesn't matter what the location cause is also an expense to the project as well. So it's an inherent risk evaluation. Like every utility we do engage and member we engage, we see that inherent risk evaluation as to what are the risks you know, associated to that. We say, okay, if this is a risk, let's try to mitigate the risk by talking to, talking to the utility members. Uh, it could be any of the municipalities infrastructure, any of the utilities out there, mitigate the hazards, see what is, um, and Victor is gonna go actually in detail of what the mitigation of the hazard means, uh, training required and quality expectation that everyone is looking to see. At the final end end of it, there will be some residual hazards and risks that are associated, and this will come to a dollar amount. Obviously, how much we can take on, and that all boils down to the liability of it. You know, the the record keeping and all that. And again, Victor will go on the field safety aspect of it after. But all that boils down to how we're going to build the agreement. Now, Ontario One Call does support and provide you and all of the members with a standard agreement that is legally binding. Um, you are all able to modify that legally binding document that you and I can talk about and or or two parties can collaborate to talk talk about and actually have that legally binding understand the understand the risk understand what risk you have and how we can mitigate it operational point of view understand the map mapping access which which we're going to take how are you going to share who is going to share and how we are going to keep that data maintenance that's those, those are the important key, key findings and, and the maintenance piece of it, really. Um, I'll hand it over to uh, Victor for now. And then, Victor, you let me know how, as you as, as I navigate through, so feel free. No problem. Thank you, Ifti, and afternoon to everybody. Thanks for joining this. And I will just uh, continue where Ifti left off, which is the most important thing here at LTS, Lead Core, is safety. Um, safety is the top priority. and Safety is basically what we strive on um, and to improve safety on the locates end, uh, we find that adequate utility records and proper documentation, real uh, on site and real time communication and conflict resolutions, uh, utilizing uh, excavators own equipment are just some key factors and stuff we have implemented implemented here at lead core to improving safety uh, for utility locating as we all know damage prevention is the key here and that's exactly what we are doing through our uh, throughout all of our projects go ahead to the next slide safety qa and quality control you see again two other uh, really important um, uh, key factors to talk about in regards to safety it's implementing an auditing and a QA score, scorecard for our work being performed out in the field on the locate end, uh, identifying inaccurate locate reports and damage investigations, and providing those reports to the utility owners. Uh, discrepancy and escalation process, another key thing that we've developed here at LEDCOR. Uh, this is uh, to go in partial with um, or, uh, rectifying uh, on site resolutions. And most importantly, proper training and well guided field support. Uh, without the proper training and well guided field support, our locators are out there or have limited um, expect um, limited capabilities. And you can go ahead, Ifti, to the next one. 
we'll talk a little bit about mapping and record and record access. Uh, Multiviewer, KMZ, KMLs, as built PDFs, ArcGIS, online web based programs are just some of the different styles and types of records that our locators receive to perform uh, locates for utility members. And it's also to be noted that utility owners records and mappings are to be used as a guide only. Full assessment in the field is required to, to, to perform a correct locate, taking the mapping, field assessment, the escalation process into account is imperative to marking uh, a utility members plant accurate. Go ahead to the next one, Ifti. And field support. <clears throat> uh, like mentioned, training. Uh, a member who can provide training and share any of their utility based knowledge with the DLSP will only increase safe excavation practices and the protection of their underground infrastructure. Equipment used is the RD uh, radio detection locate set. Um, identifying uh, identification of utility owners, pedestals, terminals, vaults, furniture, etc., is imperative for any DLSP to correctly uh, locate any utilities plant, as well as utility owners' specialized tools like uh, ped wrenches, keys, access codes are mandatory for a DLSP to accurately locate, uh, locate and identify a member's plant. These are some definitely some challenges that we've been working on over the past months, having all these uh, things in place to provide an accurate locate. We do reach out directly to the utility member uh, for support when we can't access their plant uh, or their terminals, uh, when we're looking for more uh, updated records or further information. Uh, the buck doesn't just stop at the locator in the field. We do our best to bring it up to the utility member, uh, work with them, finding the best uh, resolution and also take that to the field uh, to resolve any conflicts. Uh, so in between all aspects, the, the, the key point is the damage prevention is in place. And that's really what we're trying to do is mitigate uh, any damage to any utility members, whether it's public or private. You can go ahead there if you to the last one, just some frequently asked questions. Who pays for the service, right? Project owners uh, will be paying for the service as they are the approvers. Uh, a lot of members are worried about uh, their infrastructure being damaged. Of course, well, DLSPs are required to meet specific criteria based uh, as defined by the infrastructure owner, such as specialized training, uh, quality assurance audits, reporting, insurance liability, like uh, Ifti mentioned, and ticket management systems. What new technologies are being used in underground utility locating? Subsurface utility engineering, also known as SUE, is being implemented, as well as GPR, ground penetrating radar systems, as well as something new that's being introdu introduced is augmented reality. How can I, how can I, I'm sorry, how close can I excavate around a member's utility? Well, always dig by hand or hydrovac expose when you're within one meter of the underground facility. And what do you till what utilities do DLSP utility locators mark? Well, DLSP uh, locators mark public and private owned utilities. If they can be provided with the mapping of their infrastructure or can be visually located in the field. And this is another uh, important uh, topic to discuss as we work with the utility member to resolve those conflicts in the field uh, when some of their mapping uh, does not show what's been located in the field. We follow our discrepancy process and go through the proper chains so we can correctly identify and locate a utility members own plant, whether it's on their mapping or not. So that's it. Uh, bring us to the conclusion of the slides. And Marco will hand it over to you, but if there's any questions and answers, we're more than happy to happy to hear an answer for you, for you as well and from the members. OK. Perfect. Thank you for that, guys. Thank you for the very informative session there and kind of helping us better understand, you know, the perspective from, you know, your position there as a DLSP. 
And also some of the great benefits that you have pointed out uh, as being the constructor or as the at the same time for your site, they're giving you the capabilities, uh, you know, mitigating some of these situations right on site, um, having it firsthand with, you know, with all resources all on deck at, the, at that point, right? Having it all in one, pretty much uh, going out there for the constructor, uh, going out there to to assess the 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 areas at first, then the locate and the discrepancy is kind of tracking back all all in all to that. So it is a, a fantastic model that I, I do appreciate you guys sharing that across the board here. Now we'll leave it up to the um, open floor now here for our session here. So once again, you can raise up your hands uh, if you want to speak out if you have any questions or you can use the tool function here for the uh, on the top left hand corner there is a q and a section there that you can type in your questions um, and one of our coordinators will be out there um, that will be able to um, relate your questions there <clears throat> now maybe i'll get things started here while meanwhile um, you know people set out their questions here uh, just questions on your side of things now you know, we understand from the previous slides on our side here where a lot of the works are coming across the rural areas, right? Uh, with rural areas, more municipalities are, are being affected within the project areas and such. And, you know, a lot of the municipalities or most municipalities are, are, are somewhat don't have the accurate mapping or are not able to provide mapping. You know, as Ledcore coming across onto that seg uh, onto that segments, um, what is really your best approach to approach these members, and also with our assistance on our side, obviously to get conversation going. But you know, to keep an ease to a member, what what are some of the key points in conversation that will allow you guys to help a member to establish some form of mapping or some form moving forward uh, uh, without a mapping? I can take this one. I can, um, Rick. Uh, so I think our first approach is um, if they're if they're a registered mem, um, even if they don't have have a certain set of planned mapping, uh, they would always locate their infrastructure. So there must be a way to locate. The idea is to uh, get introduced to that member and understand how they're how they would be locating their infrastructure in the first place. And they know when they teach us how to locate their infrastructure the right way, mapping becomes as a guide only. Like, like Victor mentioned in the slides, we would learn the process of their mapping. We're not new into this um, arena or, or in, uh, on this locate status, but yes, we would, they would slowly create the mapping as we go so that they, it can be transferred over from. So it, it would create some sort of new learning, uh, but at the same time, we are not stopping the project. Uh, we are doing status quo of how they are uh, going to be performing. And if, if it needs a step of approval, um, we'll say that, you know, uh, you can, we can send the locates to you for approval and we can go on that basis too. And that's fine as well. So we can actually guide them and help them create the mapping for them for the future as well. Not not the best way to always do it, um, rather have mapping, but it is one of the solutions. I'll add uh, something on that as well. Um, another ability or capability that we're able to implement, and we have, and some utility members already have this in place, is record corrections. And what that is, is utility owner has provided their mapping. Uh, we have identified a discrepancy. We complete a records correction form by providing the utility member uh, with uh, the discrepancy and the accurate location of their uh, plant. Uh, that gets shared with them and then it's their obligation or it's up to them uh, to take that information that we've um, verified out in the field and to add it and to update their records for any other um, LSPs that are going to be out there performing this work. Now they have uh, some insight about uh, some plant that may not be known or that some updating of their records are inaccurate. So a records correction form is, is, is a way to go when working between uh, a utility member and, and the LSP or DLSP, please. Yeah, that, that, that's certainly a good point here, um, especially for the, the, you know, obviously for some infrastructure that are not accurate onto the record or some infrastructure that you come across with that that is not shown onto the locates. Um, you know, it's really good practice at, at that point, allowing the infrastructure owner to allow um, to, you know, to be advice of that. Um, and part reason that we've been educating of this is that, you know, dedicated locator is not a, a matter of just providing locates on a timely matter for project. There is a lot of safety aspect to it, and that speaks of it as well, too, for future runs of any other, um, you know, 
locate service provider or even any major project come across that you know that mislocated uh, infrastructure mis uh, map infrastructure is already recorded and you know to mitigate damage future damages so that's very good now i don't see any questions on hand here as well too um <clears throat> trying to go back here again now I, I saw in your previous slide there if the um, that you guys kind of have your own equipment and kind of one and done like i said so um in your approach to new areas um to better have understanding of infrastructure how often do you guys do um like a scope out like either just locating or even going into sue um and just kind of working with the affected members and understanding where your work areas and the project areas to see what exactly members are affected. Um, as a lot of you may know that a lot of the deal projects or by brand projects are in a scale of regionals. Uh, right. But in that case, if it's regional, you know, we know that most areas are affected, but also some areas or some streets may not be affected. So with project owners and DLSPs working hand in hand with yourself, understanding the project scope, how can we, you know, obviously help mitigate some of the member lists and some of the members that are not possibly affected for the uh, for the project to, you know, to to get that understanding on your side of things and working hand in hand with a project owner. I, th I think the very first step does help us to approach the members is actually your member list that comes across and then we verify that data with where our data for the project scope is. So as, as you know, usually the industry, we, we go from road to road and it's really movement. Uh, but one of that approaches that really helps as as one guideline. The next guideline that helps are actually permitting. What permitting process uh, was used during the design phase? In some cases, uh, we need to give offsets for the major utilities. So we already know where some of the utilities exist, right? So an engineering database um, that comes out uh, is also one of the, the second guideline. We already know what are the major impacts. The third one is obviously the uh, the municipality, the city, or the county data data sets that we have, and that helps us as well as the third layer. So we are already in talks with as we approach through a project, we are already in talks with almost most of the members. In specific, there would be some uh, some members that we we are not specifically in touch with, but uh, your again falling back to the one, two, three, your guideline helps. So we we do get in touch with them. And that's that's a very important. Uh... You know, key item there is you know communication, preliminary conversation. As what we we preach in this uh, platform here, having those earlier conversation to a member, notifying them of a project coming across. So when we actually get the official submissions and receive a notice from Ontario One Call, um, everyone can fall in line with the proper timelines uh, uh, approaching for the your legislative requirement, right? <clears throat> now I know I'm I'm kind of railing you guys here with the questions here, but I I know this is previous experience and, and some of the questions that's been asked on this platform from some of the members um, regarding the agreements and contract. And once again, similar to municipalities where some resources, they may not have resource for a legal team to go to, you know, a formal agreement and such like that, right? Um, we we do have our standard agreements that we do provide uh, as a sample, as a, you know, as a foundation and so sort, but obviously that leaves it up to the DLSP and the member to, to Pick out what's required and what you know what to kind of move forward and it's legal binded just what you advise on to your presentation there now approaching a member with with, with no um contract on hand um is it necessary for you know for lts to move forward and just ensuring that you possibly take a control of the agreement to uh, help them assist them to kind of go into the escalation process and such like that just to kind of get it across the board um if so, what is the timeline you're looking across to that and working with the member itself as well? Yeah, and we have certainly, that's a great question, Marco. We've, we've actually come across some of the few members that, that uh, do not have, the, have their legal to go back to, but one of the key points I want to mention, and we're very thorough with it, uh, the, the Ontario One Call um, legal document is pretty, pretty, pretty darn good um, as, as a step in just to use that. Uh, we can help with our legal services, uh, for sure. Um, just as the, as the signing of contract, we can tell we can tell exactly what the document is about. Um, at the end of the day, it is up to the member still. So I we still leave that up to the member, although supporting them and guiding them to understand the whole uh, of the legal document. Well, 
because it is a well thorough document that we already sent, we try to base off most of the agreements to that, uh, that document that we already get. Right? We don't try to, now, now some of the members do have a different set of documents, which is okay, which means they might have their own legal and we have our own legal and we always obviously work together and get it across. But yes, we are always, work, like I said, working collaboratively. So understanding, making each other agree upon certain terms and conditions are extremely important. And we go even one step a bit higher. Now, not everybody is able to understand the legal terms pretty well. So although, although giving this in simple terms is one of the key, um, trying, to, trying to say that, hey, if, um, because of the insurances and liabilities we have, say, hey, irrespective of all the mapping and anything happens, you know, we do cover your utility as, as part of our insurances and liability. Right. If we do have an error that is at, at we are at fault, um, you need to understand that we will cover you, right? And and that's the that's the key piece. It's, it's 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 that explains it pretty well. And as long as you can put them at ease, and and most of them are at ease, that should be fine. It's no different from what the LSPs were doing before. It is even better now that we are the excavators as well. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, going back to, I, I'm, I, I'm thinking it's Victor that, that came across the risk mitigation of it. Um, obviously, there are some scenarios where we've seen members that just provide their mapping and kind of say, here you go, here's our sign off, everything's good to go. Um, on your side as lead core, accepting that mapping, obviously you do, uh, you know, you do do your checks to ensure the mapping is sufficient for you to locate the infrastructure and such. Um, what kind of testing do you do out there? Do you guys do a field test beforehand to locate the infrastructure along with the mapping, or work with the infrastructure owner to understand your risks during those times? I'm kind of breaking it down a little bit more to your presentation there in regards about the risk management there with the infrastructure owners and what's provided to you, right? Um, yeah, so really it's, um, like I said, you know, the records are a guide, right? Any mapping provided is a guide. Really like if you mentioned the collaboration between the excavator and the locator is really where the damage prevention takes place. Um, utilizing the locators and the skill set they have uh, in conjunction with the on-site uh, in real-time communication and conflict resolutions between uh, you know excavation crew and locators is really the best practice okay um, you know we can only use we can only locate what we see or what we've been provided mapping for uh, regardless our approach is whether it's mapping that's been provided whether it's a member who signed with us uh, whether they're public or private. Um, our intentions is to locate all underground plant <clears throat> in the area of excavation, right? And it does take longer. Uh, you need a, little, need a little bit more of a thorough approach and understanding that uh, the speed of completing a locate is not the priority anymore for a DLSP. It's damage prevention. And yes, we need production from locators so we can get our drills and plows, installing plant in the ground, infrastructure in the ground. But none of that works if we're constantly uh, damaging plant. And again, like if you mentioned, it could be whether it's uh, it's the locator's fault or the excavator's fault. Internally, it's LTS's fault, right? So we really take the time. We do great field assessments. When we do have these discrepancies, we work not only with you know our excavators. We bring in city representatives uh, to have permits and running lines changed on uh, on site, uh, as we're able to prove that a utility owner may believe that their plant is on this side of the road when in actuality it's on the opposite side of the road. <clears throat> so it's. It's really imperative uh, to collaborate between the, the two parties, the excavator, the locator, as well as the utility members. Uh, and again, on-site resolution is really where it's at uh, to keep things moving, to be safe, also be productive, and, and to know that our excavators are drilling, plowing, uh, installing this plant uh, in a safe manner. Now, last thing our locators want to do, obviously, is put our own <clears throat> our own uh, partners our own employees uh, 
our own members at risk uh, for potential uh, damages as well as injury, right? So the, you know, the attitude, what I would say is uh, uh, it's safety, it's uh, accuracy over production, and it will always be so. We're continuing to add more and more locators and training to provide the production needed, uh, but also LEDCOR or LTS would support uh, slow production and uh, not compromising safety. Um, so that's just uh, an approach that we take. Um, 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 yeah, that that is uh, definitely something that uh, you know that we do educate across as well too. That we speak of a lot in regards to the dedicated locator model. Right, it's not just a matter of having a timely matter of locates and kind of you know having more efficiency surrounding locates. It's a lot of it. It's that you're mitigating a lot of the safety aspect of things. Um, you know, just as you said, there is that you have that resource on hand already. Uh, that resource and what we speak of is, and, and the difference between a public and DL is that a public locator has to attend to all public locators that's submitted within that locator's area, whether or not that's a home locate, uh, you know, uh, a fence locate that's required to a major project that's submitting 30 different locates at the same time to an emergency and such like that. So the efficiency of that one locator within their area traveling I would say 50% of their time of the day, that takes away mental drainness and everything surrounding, you know, having proper locates on hand, right? That's where the speed is because as well too is that, you know, they have to complete X amount of locates throughout, you know, their areas and such like that. So that's where speed doesn't really equates to safety. And it gets missed out into that sense where in a dedicated locator, we're opening up the, the communication between all stakeholders here. So not just between, uh, you know, an excavator and a, a locator on hand, there is the involvement of an infrastructure owner as well too, that we have all stakeholders kind of speaking to each other, you know, how do we maneuver this project safely in, 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 a, in a timely manner? And just like what you said, uh, you know, having a damage, having speed up locates and incurring damage to that would equate a lot more and cost wise of stopping a project, you know, for several days due to repairing that damage. So the, the you know, having that time to ensure that that doesn't incur and in just kind of double backing, ensuring all safety is across the board, is, it's really the way it goes uh, and what we're promoting for dedicated locator and how it is, right? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and I do appreciate that, that sharing those thoughts uh, on your guys here. Um, I'm, I'm kind of out of questions on my side here, and, I, and I'm hoping for some of these uh, uh, attendees here to to see if any other questions that you may have, not just for you know Ledcor here, um, but also to ourselves, any of the projects that you may have come across with, any share of concerns and such. Once again, you know this is an open platform. Um, you know. This is for all of us to discuss within infrastructure owners, stakeholders here, um, LEDCOR here, if, if, you know, to understand on a DLSP perspective, as a contractor perspective, how we're approaching dedicated locator, right? Um, yeah, uh, I can't think of any other questions on my side. Um, if anybody else have any questions, we can certainly, we, we do, I can give you back 15 minutes of your time. Um, but I'll leave a couple more minutes here. But if, if you know, I do understand if you have any questions further past to this, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Our our email address is deal at on1call.com. Uh, reach out to our team directly. Uh, if you want to relay any of the questions, whether or not it's through us, or if you want to add those questions directly to LTS, we'll ensure to kind of forward that over to them and can get you the proper information to that across the board. Um, but uh, right now, if I don't see any other question, I'll leave it about a minute uh, here. But uh, yeah. OK, well, I guess I'll leave everyone a 15 minute of their time. And I do really appreciate your time here, if team Victor, uh, sharing your insight for for LEDCOR um, and, you know, your projects and, and approach of the DLSP. Uh, it is much appreciated to that. And uh, yeah, we just look forward to working with you all and, and also with a lot of these members on these calls as well, too. Uh, if there's nothing else, thank you uh, very much and have a great afternoon, everyone. Excellent, Marco. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate the time.